All right. Happy November. We're here. You're probably wondering why I am sitting in this kind of dark cavernous place instead of my usual studio. And yes, I have been cast into the exterior darkness where there is great wailing and gnashing of teeth, which we'll be featuring later in the show. We are here. Uh, why are we here? We're here because the, we, they are redoing the building in which our studio is located. And so we have come into this other building, which the Daily Wire now also owns. So think about this for a minute. I've been cast out here uh, into a situation that's very much like it was like when we began, which is, I don't know, it's, it seems like about 20 minutes ago, but it was maybe three years ago when we started out. And now the Daily Wire, which started out in Jeremy the God King's backyard uh, in his pool house, now owns two buildings and is expanding. And soon, of course, will actually uh, march on uh, San Diego and take it over by military force. So it really is, a, it's been an amazing, amazing journey, uh, just incredible uh, success of this website and of these podcasts. And it's just been terrific. And it's interesting because it makes me think back to the fact that, you know, I never conceived, I, I started out, I, we thought we would just do a pure cultural webcast. I was just going to talk about the culture from a political standpoint, but we realized the Daily Wire is a political site and it was attracting a lot of political folks and people who thought about politics first. And so slowly the show has morphed into a political, more of a political show than a pure cultural show. But I never wanted this to be a headline show. I figure, you know, you're adults, you can go out, you can find the headlines yourself, you can find out what the news is. Nor did I want to say, here's what you should think about this, because I also think you're adults and you should be able to figure out for yourself what you think about things. But I, I feel I have a peculiar talent, especially in the conservative fold, which is that I'm a storyteller. I'm a lifelong storyteller. I've made my living at it. I've made a very particularly good living at it. I've had a lot of success with it. And so I think I'm pretty good at it. And because I'm a storyteller, I understand the way narrative works. I've worked very hard to understand the way narrative works. I, I sometimes talk about the fact that because I'm a crime writer, I can Try, I can gauge almost to the word when you will figure out the next twist, because you always want to figure out the twist before I reveal it. You always want to feel that you're smarter than I am, so I always arrange for you to figure it out a few pages before, and I can almost tell you the word on which you're going to figure that out. I'm good at what I do, and so are the people who deliver the news, and so are politicians, and so are academics, and so, of course, are the people in Hollywood, and all of those people are affecting the narrative and affecting the atmosphere in which we live. They affect the emotional atmosphere in which we live. Uh, somebody said to me recently, nobody hears what you say, they just hear how you make them feel, and that is what they really are in charge of, is how they make them feel. And what I've always thought is you can come here every day, come here every day, and what I will do is try to shift your perspective so that you see how things, so that you have a chance to clear your mind of the narrative and see how things really are. That's what the show is about, basically. It's letting you step back and clear your mind, which I do every day, because all this news, all this information, all this entertainment is pouring in largely from a left-wing perspective, largely geared to creating certain effects in your mind, an effect of panic, an effect of crisis, an effect that, that you're always on the defense, that you're never on the offense, that nobody is serving you, and yet you're, and you're being ignored. All these things are fomented by this, the people who are very talented at telling this narrative, and so I try to break that out. I have to say, in the last couple of days, as I have stepped back, as I have stepped back and looked around, I was simply amazed at how much crap we have been dealt in these two years since Trump became president. Now, it was going on before this narrative, as I've said before, this narrative that Donald Trump, everybody was lovely, everything was rosy, we were traipsing around, we were all friends, and then Donald Trump came and everything went wrong. Not true. They have been doing this for years and years, decades and decades. They called Bush Hitler, they called Mitt Romney, the dog killing, you know, guy who stopped, remember, stuffing the women in binders. They have been dealing in crap for a long time, but Trump amps up everything. And one of the ways Trump fights back against them is by throwing crap right back at him. So that now it's flying from all sides and we are left kind of trying to figure out where is the, the real thing. But there is so much crap. I mean, think about the Russian collusion story. Think about that. Is there any chance that Robert Mueller is gonna come out and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, Donald was on the phone to Vladimir when Vlad meant Don, you know, it was just love at first sight and they were talking, you know, how can we affect this election? 
Google has tampered with this election more than the Russians ever tampered with the last election. I remember when Max Boot was on. Max Boot is a smart guy, but I think he's lost his way. I do. I think he's, you know, Trump drives people crazy. And I think Max Boot is on there saying, oh, well, he stole the, the Russians stole and he colluded. You know, just it's just crap. It's nonsense. And it was their attempt there. They actually thought, remember yesterday we played that that montage of news people saying, oh, you know, it's all over today. This is the beginning of the end. They actually thought they were going to rewrite the results of the election. They still may have that hope, but I don't think so. It's interesting how it's faded away. Interesting how the capital, you know, Molly Hemingway did a piece in The Federalist just talking about crap, just talking about the amount of crap we've been dealing with. Molly Hemingway wrote a piece in The Federalist yesterday about what Where's, where's the Kavanaugh story? I mean, if Kavanaugh is a serial rapist, shouldn't there be a team of reporters following the story? I mean, after all, you know, no one is safe in the halls of the Supreme Court with that Kavanaugh running around. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is probably running around the, you know, the desk. I mean, she's just, he's chasing her around because we cannot trust this guy. He's spiking the punch. They're lining up and, you know, having gang rapes and all this. That's what's now happening in the Supreme Court. Nobody's covering it. Why? Because the entire story was crap. It was just garbage. Even, and even, you know, Me Too, I, I actually have sympathy with the Me Too movement, the core of the Me Too movement, the idea that women should be able to go to work and be treated politely and professionally. I don't think that means you can't look at a picture of Meghan Markle and say she's she's a cutie pie. I don't think that means that you can't flirt. I don't think that means you can't date. If, if people couldn't date at work, a lot of people wouldn't be married and have kids who were married and have kids today. But, but. The Me Too movement was hijacked almost instantaneously. And what the Me Too movement really is, really is, is the dross of feminism. It's the out, uh, you know, the result of feminism, the result of the sexual revolution, all of this stuff.